Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Prime Cuts for this Sunday, July 8th, 2018, as we continue our IPCPR Daily Pre-Game Series. Tonight, we'll start to look at some trends of what to expect at IPCPR, and we'll take a look specifically at the definition of of what a new cigar now is and we'll also talk about a cigar that may be falling out of uh, the mainstream at IPCPR. In our um, product segment we'll take a look at the revamping of the aging room portfolio and I'll talk about a couple of cigars from Cornelius and Anthony. And as always, this episode of The Primetime Show is sponsored by Lane Coffee. Lane Coffee is for those who actually care about the coffee they drink. Just like with cigars, there's quality versus quantity, and both have their place. But Lane Coffee believes in quality. Roasted fresh in individual batches using only 100% specialty coffee from responsible sources. Visit www.lanecoffee.com. And by Saga Cigars, the official sponsor of the 2018 IPCPR coverage on Cigar Coop. With Saga Cigars, the Saga Blend Number no. 7 is a cigar that has delivered the perfect combination of knowledge of traditional tobaccos and a new balance that today's cigar enthusiasts have come to love in a finer cigar. Leveraging six generations of experience and tradition of the Reyes family, the Saga Blend Number no. 7 delivers a full-flavored, medium-bodied cigar. The cigar is highlighted by a Brazilian wrapper over a blend of Central American and Dominican tobacco. Available in three sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Blend Number no. 7 is sure to please and bring together past and present. Well, welcome everybody to a Sunday night edition of Prime Cuts. Um, this is um, our IPCR pregame series. This is July 8th, 2018, and we are in the home stretch as far as um, IPCPR goes. Because when Friday comes along, we will be in Las Vegas as the convention opens, and then Saturday morning, the, the big event, the trade show opens. So we are really hitting the home stretch. In fact, this is the uh, last night I'll be in the Sereno Cigar Company studios because um, I will be beginning my journey out to IPCPR um, tomorrow afternoon. And I will be, um, as folks know, I, I, tend, I don't fly to IPCPR. Uh, I, I will be driving, um, and virtually I'll be driving the pink Cadillac. I don't have a pink Cadillac I'm taking out there, but the pink Cadillac has kind of become this, uh, I, I guess it's like a mascot or a symbol. It's just something that's kind of uh, I love, so I just kind of put it out there. But uh, you'll be we'll be doing some prime cuts from the road, hopefully, uh, throughout the week. My, my goal is I want to do a couple of these outdoors, particularly when we get into the uh, some of the really cool areas of the country. But the heat may be the issue, uh, and, the, and the equipment does not like the heat. So uh, we'll have to stay tuned on that, and we'll have some availability as far as the times go. Uh, the plan is Prime Cuts will run through Thursday, um, and I'm going to try to do one on Friday uh, as well, but that may be a little more challenging. I could tell you that once the trade show floor opens, we'll try to get some Prime Cuts in. It's very, very difficult with our schedule and our resources. Um, but, you know, I, I was here in the uh, Sereno Cigar Company studios, uh, had this, uh, you know, kind of— Wrapped it up with a movie and with a great dinner. Um, brought in some lobster rolls, so um, you know from Cousins, uh, which they actually have a truck that comes around here, uh, and they make a Connecticut lobster roll, which is absolutely killer. It's on that New England style bun, which is and it's got that. Um, it doesn't have the mayo. It's got like the lemon on it, and and they load this thing up with lobster meat. Uh, had a little clam chowder to go with that. So I mean, um, I kind of had a little bit of New England in me from my trip. Up there last week with Stogie Santa. Um, spent a couple days with Stogie Santa. Can't forget uh, Joe D. You know, Joe D and I, uh, we have a common bond. We used to both be on Stogie Geeks together. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, that was a, a very good trip. I couldn't get New England out of me. Um, and then I watched, um, guys, if you haven't watched The Lords of Flatbush, um, one of the one of the all-time great movies of all time, is what I'll just say. It's a movie that's probably about 45 years old already, and uh, it's a Sylvester Stallone's in the movie. Uh, there's a, he kind of plays this goober type of guy, uh, who, uh, in the movie, but there's a, there's just a scene in that movie where he's kind of, uh, uh, his girlfriend and his girlfriend's friends bully him into, uh, getting him and getting them a very expensive engagement ring. Just, just great stuff. But, uh, if you get, you gotta go see the Lords of Flatbush, you know, get it at this point. It's a movie that's been out for years. 
Excuse me, I'm going to lose my voice, I think, tonight with Prime Cuts. But uh, we'll, we'll see what we can go. But today on Cigar Coop, um, I published my annual uh, Trends to Expect at the IPCPR article. And a lot of these trends I've talked about on um, previous installments of Time Cuts. Prime, time Cuts. Like I said, I'm losing my voice tonight. Uh, on Prime Cuts. But um, as far as that goes, it's a, the ability to um, go ahead and... Um, kind of articulate it in a single article where we can uh, kind of look at it. It gives me a chance to put some additional thoughts in it. Um, so there's a couple of things tonight. I, there's about, I, I came up with seven trends, and I'll kind of go through some of the trends throughout the week here on um, the Prime Cuts installments. I'm going to hydrate a little here. But um, really, this this topic, I guess, came up on last night's Prime Cuts. We had some folks in the, uh, the chat room from the industry and somehow we got on the topic of the the definition of new product and you know let's go back two years ago in the cigar business um to actually specifically the ipcbr trade show two years ago that trade show had to be the one in las vegas it was the most surreal trade show i think ever okay it was you want to talk about um it was almost like when we got there, everyone thought it was the last day of summer vacation. I mean, you had that. Everyone had that look on their face of, you know, there was an exasperation. Like it was like that. You know what? You know, you were a kid and you knew you were going back to school the next day after summer vacation. It was almost that look. A lot of people were dreading the trade show that year, um, and this was because in less than two weeks, on August eighth, following that trade show in two thousand sixteen, the deeming regulations were going into place, and there was this doomsday scenario that we, I think. No one knew what to expect two years ago. This this had hit the, the industry like a ton of bricks. And, you know, one of the requirements was going to be that after August 8th, you had to have FDA approval to register a new product. Um, and um, it created a bunch of, it created, you know, kind of this very much uh, a cast a shadow of doubt what was going to happen. And, you know, on top of that, the products that weren't grandfathered were going to have to come off the market um, on August 8th of 2018, and that's since been pushed out to 2021, three years, but that's still something we're going to have to face down the road, but, you know, but there's there's things happening in the industry. I think the one thing we're seeing is this is a long battle with the FDA. You know, it, this battle is going to go on for 10 years. I mean, I'm just, it, we, we, you know, so, you know, but I think back two years ago, we had this doomsday scenario. And, you know, a lot of the pundits and media, I, I heard a couple of shows come out there and say, um, no new products. Uh, this is it. Uh, we're done. Uh, you know, this is it. FDA. Fuck the FDA. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, you know, and look, I heard, you know, I'm not a fan of the FDA either, but, you know, it is what it is, unfortunately, right? But, you know, not a good thing for the industry. But right around that, when we got to that August 8th standpoint, um, we started seeing these cigars, like, pop up into stores. And it was called Stealth Cigars. Uh, well, I called them Stealth Cigars, okay? They were basically cigars that we didn't hear about, right? But they were showing up at stores, and in some cases, they were actually being put on the shelves. And what the cigar industry was doing is they were kind of beating the FDA deadline by introducing some things into market, right? I, I had a real problem with it, okay? I, I don't think it was a good thing, okay, for the industry for a lot of reasons, right? I understand why it was done, right? But I, I, think, in, I think the problem is, you know, to put that stuff in front of consumers was the wrong thing to do. Uh, you know, you put up, you know, one thing I think, you know, the cigar industry we do is we, there's pride in the craftsmanship, there's pride in the marketing that's done. And, you know, when you just kind of throw something out there for the consumers, I, I think it was a little misleading. So I don't like it, but I understand why it was done. You know, I'm not going to argue why it was done. It was a survival need, right? But I didn't like it, right? Um, but we started to see these stealth, stealth products. Um, we're now two years later, right? And I, I'll tell you what, I'm getting ready for the IPCPR trade show. I am still working through a backlog. I caught. I thought I caught up yesterday of press releases, okay, of new things that are getting announced, okay? So we're seeing new things. There's going to be things at the trade show to see, right? So the question is, well, what's going on here? It was all, were all these things like stealth products? What, what, what's actually going on? So the answer is that the definition of new is changing, okay? Um, and what it's really falling into, I would say, you know, for here's the thing. 
No one I know is going to the FDA asking for pre-market approval. I don't think there's one company that's done that so far, okay? So the stuff you're seeing is not stuff that has gotten the FDA blessing. Because the day that happens, it's going to be huge news, right? So I, I don't think that's anything. So all this stuff, somehow the industry's found a way to adapt to this. Um, and really, there's been three ways I've seen it, okay? I've looked at this, and I've seen three things. So first of all, the stealth products have eventually, that were kind of clandestine introduced to market, have eventually, uh, now are eventually having a formal release. So they're kind of having their moment in the sun, so to speak. Um, and now we're, now we're like pretending that they never were released, but we're, we're just kind of erasing history that they were on the shelves, and now we're talking about them okay so there, there are products that are out there that are doing that um and and you could see some of the lines that that certainly did that right um you know you could go back and uh you could probably remember what some of those things were and, and they, they made it into market and, and okay you know the the like i said i didn't like the fact when it was done but now they're 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 being introduced to market. The funny thing is no one would comment on those products either. It was kind of funny. No one wanted to even talk about those products, right? Um, my pro like I said, my bigger problem with that was that they were going on the shelves, right? That That's where I had the problem with it, right? Um, but I guess, like I said, you had to do it. It was a survival mode. If you didn't do it the right way, it could have been a, a bad thing. So I get all that, right? I just, like I said, from the other, I just take the other side of point of view is it's, it's tough. I would have liked to have seen some level of marketing behind that is kind of where I was getting at. But the other thing that's happening is we're seeing some products that have been grandfathered brands, uh, products that were on the market on February 15th, 2007 or beforehand, basically be in reintroduced to market. So, you know, Gurkha's got a bunch of products they've been working through on that. Um, and in cases like Illusioni, they actually acquired a grandfathered brand with um, one-off. So some things, it's kind of that what's new is uh, what's old kind of scenario. Um, you know, you're seeing some things that you, you know, so you're seeing some things kind of go out there and come back. You know, Old World Reserve by Rocky Patel is coming back this year. Um, that was a predicate product that never went away, actually. It was uh, somehow on, on Thompson for a while, which I, I never understood why they never, they never really promoted the fact that they were the exclusive home of that, that brand for a while. That always kind of puzzled me, but, but it was out there. So, you know, Old World Reserve now is going back into a national spotlight. You've seen some of the, the Gurkha releases come back into a, you know, a national spotlight. Some of their flavored cigars last year, you know, they introduced some cigars um, as well that came back. So, you know, they're bringing some things back, um, you know, to the forefront. And then the third thing, and this is, I think, the one where we're, why we're seeing so much new products. So, there's this third category of basically rebranded products, okay? And what these are is um, these are products that are that basically fall within the FDA guidelines. Either that they're grandfathered products, or the blends have been, they can demonstrate that these are grandfathered blends or substantially equivalent grandfathered blends. And what they are doing is they're putting some new packaging on it. They're kind of polishing it up, giving it a nice coat of paint, so to speak. And they can demonstrate that yet yeah, what's it's it was act maybe it was something different, but now it's they, they can reintroduce it because it's something uh, that falls under that grandfather or that substantial equivalency. Now, what kind of facilitated that? There was a court decision a couple of years ago that allows tobacco uh, companies to make packaging changes but not make box count changes, and that's a that was a key decision because what that did is that gave the ability for tobacco companies to rebrand stuff, to change the packaging, um, to change some names. So a lot of that's fallen under, where when we were under the doomsday scenario two years ago at the trade show, the, they, the industry did not know they were going to have that option in front of them. So that was a very, very important piece of information that that, that came out. Like So two years later, we suddenly have these, these categories. So again, I think it's a combination of the stealth products, the grandfathered products, and, and some of the rebranded products that have kind of put all this into, into play right now. And, and certainly, it's, it's, uh, I, here's what I think we'll say, is, is maybe some of the blending creativity is slowed. I mean, I think it's fair to say some of that part is definitely slowed down, at least from the U.S. market. Uh, some of that innovation, unfortunately, um, no matter how you look at it, uh, it's probably changed. And um, as far as, um, you know, marketing innovation, a lot of it's still there. So, um, you know, as far as that goes. Um, so, you know, you got you got that combination. It's kept the industry vibrant, I guess, so to speak. Um, 
I don't know if my my picture just died on this, by the way, but boy, I just got I just got the uh, blue screen of death on the on the video feed, but it looks okay here. So uh, as far as that goes, I think it was all good right now um, that we're seeing. So those were some good things that that I think you know have happened and why we have some new products there. Now the other thing that I could say is um, when we look at some of the trends, I'm you know I remember if we go back about three years ago. Um, you know, actually, let's go back about five years ago. You know, you go back to 2012, and we started seeing the rise of the Super Gordo cigars, um, the cigars that were pushing beyond the 60 ring gauge. So we saw, I would say, three brands kind of take the lead with that, where they actually built, uh, or three companies build brands around those big ring gauge cigars. Uh, the first one was uh, E.P. Carrillo with the Inch, and then... Uh, Simultaneously, Asylum Cigars kind of built their brand around these big ring gauge cigars. And then shortly after that, Casa Fernandez with the JRFR Lunatics became that third one. And, and they all kind of started pushing these, these uh, 70 ring gauges, these 80 ring gauges. And, you know, I, and the first thing I heard is how terrible they are. Um, and you know, I, I don't, I don't, miss, I think any, if anything gets a cigar smoker into something, uh, it's not my personal choice of things. Um, I have had some 70s ring gauge cigars that are good, by the way. And I've had, you know, so I'm not going to complain about that, but it's not my first choice. But what we started seeing, I think, going from like 2013 on, is we started seeing now the Super Gordo become more and more prevalent uh, in, in lines. What m many companies were introducing these 60 plus ring gauge cigars into their regular production. Um, and we started seeing those essentially uh, start to permeate the market. So you go back to about 2015. And, and even the doomsday year of 2016, there were plenty of like 70 ring gauge cigars that were, were being, uh, you saw at IPCPR or on, on the on the product, on the order sheets, you were seeing them, right? This year's a different story. Um, kind of going through things, we've come full circle on that. I think that Super Gordo thing has, has started to significantly fade. Now, I think the three brands that we talked about, Inch, Asylum, and JFR Lunatic are exceptions to the rule because they have built those uh those particular lines on or those brands on those big ring gauges so i don't i don't think they'll, they're they're gonna stay healthy but you know some of the ones that we were just seeing into mainstream cigars they're kind of going away right now and i think that's a big trend that we've seen this year um you know i'll also say another thing i think the super gordos were i, I keep hearing every year about year of the lancero at ipcbr i'm telling you the super gordos were were way more prominent than the Lanceros ever would. The Lanceros got a lot of attention from the cigar from the cigar connoisseurs and the cigar geeky kind of guys, but the Super Gordos were, were present. I'm seeing a lot less of them this year. I'm not saying they're gone, but I'm seeing a lot less of them being introduced. Now, as far as the 60 ring gauge cigar, the 60 ring gauge cigar is here to stay, okay? Um, I call it the second American Vitola. So, I think it was uh, Steve Saka that told me that the Toro was really an American Vitola. At least he kind of put that into my head that the, the you know, the, the 6 by 50, 52 is a very Americanized size. I think the other Americanized size is this 60 ring gauge Gordo, even though they did have them in Cuba. They, 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 you can find 60 ring gauges in Cuba. Um, and I have smoked 60 ring gauges, particularly the, uh, the custom rolls that are down there, right? But um, the 60 ring gauge is not going away. Um, and, and I, like I said, I always take the full, I think if you heard me, I always say size matters. Um, every blend, the tobacco does a different thing with, with, the, with the Vitola. I've had some Lanceros that are awful in very good blends, right? Awful Lanceros. And I've had some 60 ring gauge cigars that excel in, in something you wouldn't think. So I think, I think again, you got to let the tobacco kind of dictate it. But I think it's a trend with IPCBR. The Super Gordo is, I think it's run its course right now. So um, I think people who are anti-Super Gordo, uh, I think we're, we're starting to kind of come out of that. Uh, I think there'll always be some in the market. They'll never totally go away. Uh, they are novelties. And, and, and look, if it brings a new cigar smoker in, because they think they're getting some value at a 70, what I've seen is I've seen people who've tried 60 and 70 ring age cigars, 
And then they kind of start to whittle back. They kind of come back. They start going into the Toros and maybe the Corona Gordas. And, and, and I can tell you, I came in through the ranks like that because I came in at the really heavy at the beginning of the 60 ring gauge era. You know, and I was like the big, I love those Tony Soprano size cigars, right? I still, I still like 60 ring gauge cigars. I'm not going to lie. But, but eventually I've gotten to appreciate the connoisseur sizes as well. Uh, so, you know, you certainly come and do that. So I, I think, you know, as the market starts to mature, but I think a lot of that, I think that, that trend at IPCPR, I think we, we've seen it sunset right now. So those are a couple of trends. We'll hit a couple more this week. Will Cooper, I am in the Sereno Cigar Company studios on the eve of the pink Cadillac taking off for Las Vegas. I'm on the eve here. Uh, the, the, I'm telling you, things are packed up. My girl, I mean, if people want to know why I drive to IPCPR, the freight this stuff out there would cost me, or fly this stuff out there or ship it would cost me a small fortune, right? Uh, at least I could smoke for the next few days. Um, so thank goodness right now. Well, a couple of things I want to talk about, and I mentioned this one last night, was, um, you know, there was a big announcement about a week and a half ago. Um, we'll get you about a week. Yeah, about a, let's say about a week and a half ago. Um, and it involves uh, Boutique Blends, uh, the company uh, owned by... Uh, Rafael Nodell and his wife and Hank Bischoff, and, uh, you know, they partnered uh, with Hochi Blanco on a lot of their stuff over the years. Um, Boutique Blends has been one of the most successful lines on the Cigar Coop Countdowns. In fact, they're the only brand to appear in the Cigar Coop Countdown six times. Um, so that's, that's a pretty, that's the only, they have the record there. And that's a testament to uh, the quality of the cigars that Rafael and his team have worked on over the years. You know, going back to the Oliveros days. Um, and you know, it's always been boutique plans. You know, I've always, I've watched this line grow. I've watched Raphael, uh, you know, I watched him get onto the aficionado list for the first time. I, I love the day when he got that number two, which was really the number one in the free world. Right. So, I mean, with the quattro, um, and it really, you know, kind of really just watching that line grow and blossom. Great cigars in there. Um, loved, loved what he loved, loved, still love what he's doing with that. Um, Along the way, you know, there was he kind of took Oliveros and he kind of came up with the boutique blends concept, which was more of a small batch and really yeah, the name fit boutique type blends, you know, where they were going to focus on a lot of connoisseur type cigars. And they've done some great releases and some limited production and some limited edition. I mean, I love those Fortissimo cigars. Oh, they were they were fantastic. Those Perfectos. Great cigars. Right. Um, you know, I still. Yeah, I even go back to, uh, you know, the bin number ones. I love those cigars, right? Uh, so there's some great cigars. Um, the other thing I think that's happened is as Boutique Blends grew and Raphael became, uh, you know, more and more visible, you know, he caught the eye of people in the industry. And eventually it led to a strategic alliance with one of the biggest cigar companies, Altidus. So a uh, unique arrangement where Altidus would not only handle his distribution, but Raphael would now go on and take another hat and he would start wearing uh, the other hat in the Altidus portfolio, um, which is, uh, you know, as far as the director of product capability. And if you're starting to see the announcements this year from Altidus, you're starting to see Raphael's now there a year and you can see the influence that's happening uh, because Altidus is really a company you got to watch at the trade show this year. They're, they're the stuff, and we'll t probably talk about Altidus uh, later in the week or certainly after the trade show in our post game report uh, when we see what's going on there. But he hasn't forgotten about boutique blends. Um, along the way, I think um, Boutique Blends is, has grown into several brands. You know, you had the, the Swag brand. You had uh, the La Bohem brand. You still had the Oliveros brand under there. But the one that I'd say was the workhorse of that of Boutique Blends was Aging Room. I mean, Aging Room is the one that really got Raphael on the map. It got him into the uh, Solar Aficionado Countdown. It was the Quattro F55 that... Um, that you know got him that number two slash number one cigar in the free world um so those are that's a landmark achievement that you have there um and really some really good lines there now i think along the reality is uh you know anytime you kind of have a line you gotta uh, there's points we have to kind of take a step back and evolve the portfolio and you have to sometimes do some revamping of the portfolio you know, we saw Ernesto Perez Creo Jr. two years ago overhaul his whole portfolio. It, you know, we saw Nat Sherman do it earlier this year as well, where, you know, you have to look at your marketing objectives, your business objectives, and what your the, the targets of your consumers, and you're looking to do it. Well, they announced that there was going to be an overhaul of um, Boutique Blend's portfolio, and particularly the aging room portion of that portfolio, which is, like I said, it's been the workhorse. And 
you know, so I kind of looked at it. I'm like, exciting news on one hand, right? Um, it seems like some of the other brands, like the Lobo Hems and the Swags and the Olveras, are taking a little bit of a back seat right now. But I think that's okay because I think he's still got those things in his arsenal to certainly go ahead and work with. So, um, but what I liked is uh, Aging Room kind of was a you, know, you take that brand and they kind of came up with with four segments of that brand, which I which I really liked uh, what he did. Um, the first one was the Aging Room Solera brand, which is uh, that's the one that's using the Solera aging of tobaccos and putting different vintages into bales. And that's a, a Solera came out a couple of years ago. You know, he's got four lines, Solera Corojo, Solera Shade, Solera Maduro, and the Solera Sungrom. So they're going to kind of leave Solera alone. Uh, you know, it's a line that they've kind of put a lot into. It's a kind of a unique kind of concept they're doing. So the Aging Room Solera line kind of stays as is. But there's two other lines that have really come in. Um, there's the Aging Room by Rafael Nodal line, uh, which is really going to be his core line right now. And that's going to bring, uh, it's going to have, I would say, the, um, it's going to have the lineup. I call it the cigar lineup. You know, the Connecticut, the Aging Room Connecticut, the Aging Room Habano, and the Aging Room Maduro. So you have a Connecticut, a Habano, and Maduro. Core line offerings by Rafael Nadal. Um, you know, he's had some, he's had the Habano and the Maduro in the past as Aging Room. But now he's kind of got these new, these are being positioned as new blends. The, uh, the Aging Room Connecticut, the Aging Room Abano and the Aging Room Maduro, um, and it's it's good. You know that now, you know, as the Altidus reps are going to be selling this, there's some tried and true stuff that you know you're going to have regularly available. I like the idea they put Raphael's name on it, too, because I think he's m becoming that face of Altidus, and there's a great synergy with Altidus and Boutique Blend slash Aging Room. So I think that was a really good move, and I think Aging Room deserves to have a core line. I, so I think it's a, it's a great thing to have that um, as far as, as that goes. So I think good job by Raphael. Um, look forward to smoking those cigars, certainly. I looked at the packaging. Uh, I think they, they, they did fantastic with it. Uh, I did great moves. So you have that Aging Room by Raphael Nodal line. Now, Quattro, we talked about it. Quattro became, you know, it was the most, uh, you know, that was the cigar that put him over the top, that won him the title so to speak, the championship, you know, it's become a very important part of that aging room brand um, with that F55, um, that Sumatra. And then uh, last year they extended it to add a Maduro to it. Um, so they've decided to take aging room Quattro and make it a, a line under the aging room portfolio. So you got the aging room Quattro by Rafael Nodal and Quattro box press. So, you, so they're going to bring in that, that um, they're going to bring in that, um, the F55 and the F55 Maduro, which is going to be renamed Aging Room Quattro Original and Aging Room Quattro Maduro, um, which I think, again, so you got those two things. And now they add in a Aging Room Connecticut, and uh, right? So they're going to have a Connecticut one in there and an Aging Room uh, Nicaragua, which he's going to work up with AJ. So uh, AJ Fernandez, that is. So that's a really, uh, that's a great move. You know, Raphael's got a great relationship with AJ Fernandez. They did the Pelo de Oro together. He's been working with him with some of the Altidus stuff. So so you take Quattro now, and now suddenly you, you take the one that brought Raphael to that to that height, and now he's got it in, in um, you know, you got a whole brand around it. And now you got some exciting new options that you can have around that with a Connecticut. Uh, the Maduro will, will get some, you know, certainly the Maduro now will have some legs as well. And this Nicaragua, which I think everyone's going to be looking about uh, with this box press one and see what Rafael and AJ cook up there. So you got the Adrian Quattro by Rafael Nadal um, as the third line. And then the fourth line is this Aging Room uh, by Raphael Nodal specialty line. And, I, and I, what's great about that is that's going to be the place where it looks like that's where you'll have, and this is my interpretation of this, is, is this is where you'll have some of the creative limited brands that will still go there. So it looks like Aging Room uh, Pelo de Oro will be under there. The Aging Room Puro uh, Capo, uh, is it going in there? The one he just came out with earlier in the year. Uh, you got the, um, the bin number one in there. Um, so, you know, I think you got, and certainly they can, do you know that's kind of where he can kind of do a lot of creativity i think you got that in there um and so that that's a good move as well uh the age you know the new one that he came out with the uh the pure keppa is uh the one that um was done with um that's uh, the placentias so again kind of working with a nicaraguan brand there new line gets a great thing so you got four nice pillars in there um and, you know, would I love to see some swag? I mean, I still would love to see swag Sobe 
come back. So Sobe was was love to see that one come back. Uh, you know the Labo Hams and the Labo Hams and the You know, I I think there's enough in the portfolio where they they can kind of work things and and there's all you know they, that things can certainly come uh, you know back uh, so to speak. So I think I think it's a, I think it's a I think it's a win win. I think this was a really good realignment by Raphael. Uh, what he's doing right now, I think it helps when you're positioning this with Altidus because they're being distributed by Altidus and it has a very streamlined, it's a very easy thing for the reps to follow and for the customers to follow. And I'm sure the cigars will will be excellent. So, I mean, I think, you know, because there is a track record there. So I think this is a, a well good move by Raphael on there. Um, so I'm kind of happy with that. Uh, and we'll see what happens uh, at the trade show. So I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about those cigars and see a lot more of them as well. Uh, so this is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to look here, um, see if I missed anything. And Raphael, call, Raphael's in there, actually. I just saw he's in the chat room. So uh, he called it the innovation line. And I, I like that name. Yeah, that's, I think that's where that, that's, that specialty in it line is, the innovation line. So those are my thoughts, Raphael. Um, and, and I apologize, the chat's not perfect coming up in my window. So hopefully I didn't say anything that, that uh, wrong. <laughs> but I, but I, like what, I, like, I think overall, I, uh, very good job. The other thing I want to just mention real quick, um, and uh, before we kind of sign off, is Cornelius and Anthony, um, another brand, um, you know, that's being done. Um, they make they're they're uh, the brand owned by Stephen Bailey, who's uh, from S and M Brands, comes from the cigarette business in Virginia. He got into the premium cigar business a few years ago, starting to build up a really nice portfolio, uh, mostly working with La Zona, Eric Espinosa, but there's one line he's working with. Um, as far as uh, with the LT10, the Bronze Factory, you know, they came out with two cigars. I've smoked both of these cigars. So the, there's a few cigars I did smoke before IPCBR, and I smoked both of these cigars so I could talk a little more intelligently about these releases. Um, one is called The Gent, and the other is called The Mistress. Um, and from what, they're going to be, from what I understand, more IPCPR-only uh, cigars, at least to start out with, more limited in production compared to some of the core offerings, both coming out of La Zona. Um, the, I tell you what, these are two really good cigars, and I'm not just saying, saying this. Um, they're really good cigars. Um, the Gent is the first box press cigar um, that they've done, and the, the Mistress is, is a story in itself. OK, so let me let me just kind of say something. So when I saw these press releases come out, right, and I'm going to be very transparent here. I, I the first thing I did is I looked at the wrappers of these things. Right. And I saw on the gent Ecuadorian Rosado. Right. And then I saw on the, that was on the gent. And then I went on the mistress and I saw Ecuadorian Habano. And I and I kind of I kind of just I said I actually pinged Hector uh, Alfonso, who's, you know, he kind of worked on the blends. More Habanos for Cornelius and Anthony. And he's like, dude, it's what's on. Did you look what's under those tobaccos? And I'll be honest, I didn't really because I hadn't even worked the press. I just looked at them and, and sent them that message. But yes, as I started to write it, there is much more of a story under those tobaccos. Um, so first, let's just talk about the Gent. The Gent is a um, it's a box pressed offering. Uh, so it's the first box press line that Cornelius and Anthony has. So under that risotto wrapper, they have a binder from the U.S. and they have a combination of Honduran and Nicaraguan fillers there. Um, I'll tell you what, I, I went and I smoked that thing. Um, it's a classic medium cigar is the best way to put it. We're gonna have, we'll have some more details on Coop with this uh, pretty soon. But uh, a classic medium cigar, great coffee kind of um, undertones to that cigar. So it has that coffee, it has a smoothness to it. Um, I got a little bit of a mineral component. In, actually, both of these cigars gave me a little bit of a mineral component in here. Um, Again, this the, the gent is the kind of cigar you can have any time of the day. Uh, great cigar, um, really good cigar. In fact, uh, was quite impressed with it, um, and quite impressed with both of them. But the gent was, like I said, it's a cigar I could have any time of the day. Very unique flavors to it. That one, particularly that coffee and that mineral component, kind of playing on each other. Um, good balance of sweetness and spice with that. Now, the mistress I mentioned is a whole other story. Okay. Uh, the Mistress, this is a more of a U.S.-centric blend. Uh, so it's a Habano wrapper over a U.S. binder coming from somewhere in the U.S. and a Pennsylvania filler. Um, and, you know, it's using some Lajero from Pennsylvania in there. Um, this cigar is a monster, okay? This cigar is as powerful a cigar as had in a while. Um, so I'm talking uh, in that strange level of the Neanderthal 
the uh, the Southern George Jacobs ladder. I think it's stronger than Southern George Jacobs ladder for sure. I think you're putting this up there with some of these strongest cigar, one of these strongest cigars. I've heard, you've, if you've heard saying this is the strongest cigar from Cornelius and Anthony, or the strongest star from Lazona, I'm telling you, this Mistress is the strongest cigar. It doesn't lack with flavor. That's the best thing. Is the flavor is all there. Full strength, full bodied cigar. Um, you, it, it, this has a little more of a mineral component, I would say. Um, in there, there's some natural tobacco. You get that Habano flavor. You definitely gonna get in there. Um, what's nice is there's, there's pepper. Obviously, it's got a sharp retro hail. Um, what's nice about it is I think whatever they're doing with that, um, the mineral. Like I said, there's more of a mineral component on this thing, but it's offset by the sweetness of that Habano wrapper. Um, and so I think, and that binder must be doing some magic as well. So, I mean, bet between that, two really good cigars. I spoke them both in Robusto sizes. Uh, unique offerings. So they're not your cookie cutter cigars is what I'm going to tell you. Um, I would definitely keep an eye out for these cigars um, beforehand. And I'll be like I said, we'll have some more details on Cigar Coop in the next few. Uh, we actually may have these cigars up on Coop before IPCBR. Uh, not sure yet, but we're, we're trying, we're trying on that right now. Anyway, this is Will Cooper. I am in the Serena Cigar Company studios. I'm going to close it down, uh, because, uh, my colleague Bear de Pussy has got his, El Oso from our takes. It's already started and I should have ended this four minutes ago, uh, beforehand. So I don't want to kind of cut into, uh, competing with him. Anyway, have a great night, everybody. Uh, we'll see you from the, uh, we'll see you from the road as I head out to IPCPR. And uh, we'll have lots more fun. Take care, everybody.